Friends, greetings to everyone. We are in the office of Nova, live today. Good evening. That's right, I am Fedor Konstantinov and also Vadim Zubkevich, the chief designer of Nova. Today we will talk about what has happened recently, what we have done, the direction we are moving in, and a bit about the news right away. I must emphasize that we absolutely need to finish today by 6 o'clock p.m., so please be more active in reposting for those who should be here earlier, because there won't be much time to answer questions. So let's get straight to the point. Vadim Vasilievich, let's briefly recollect what we did over the last week or two, because in the last video on Thursday, we seemed to be talking about the stratosphere. By the way, they launched a small experimental stratospheric device during the parade. I can tell you a bit about it. It actually happened this past weekend. In general, we have started a series of experimental launches. We need to carry out three launches. This is a short launch, a takeoff, and an immediate landing. We are testing the radio equipment in these three jumps, so that later we can launch the long-drifting stratospheric device that we talked about. It was on Sunday. The report on the experiment will be at the end of this week, Friday, Saturday. And we will make all the information publicly available on Monday, Tuesday. This is just a small distraction. And now about airships. And now we can talk about airships. Work is underway. One could say it is already in full swing. What has been done recently? A concept has been adopted, meaning how we will create the design bureau and what devices we will build. But I won't cover everything. I will only mention that we decided to start with the smallest device. In other words, a whole line of airships will be developed, starting with the smallest one, because both the scope of work is slightly smaller there, and it can be completed in a year, and a team can be gathered, united, nurtured, and much can be understood in such a project. Additionally, we decided that each airship we create will have its own unique feature, and the smallest airship from our line, which our design bureau will design and bring to life, will be the 2000th airship, meaning it will have a shell volume of 2000 cubic meters. Why was such a volume chosen? This is, so to speak, the maximum volume that allows for the creation of an airship that can easily fit into a 12-meter high space. This has already been discussed extensively, so we won't repeat ourselves. And it seems they have chosen a form. The shape is a standard cigar-like form, which means the shell's elongation is 4.5. I will simply say that this device, although experimental, is generally considered to have commercial applications because it turns out to be quite functional. In the passenger version, we expect it to be a six-seat device meaning one pilot and five passengers, suitable for VIP tourism and sightseeing tours. Additionally, it is important to note that it will be an excellent and versatile platform for aerial observation. Any equipment that, let's say, along with the operator, fits within a weight of 450-500 kilograms can be accommodated, including all antennas and other related equipment gravitometric equipment and various other scientific and technical equipment can be set up to monitor power lines, stadiums, and other similar structures, and conduct research. Exploring the Earth, investigating other scientific goals, in general anything that is possible can also be done. Plus it would be a very good advertising apparatus, because we have been working on it, and it turns out that very lightweight LED nets have now appeared and in this dimension, it is possible to create a device where the entire shell will be completely covered with an LED net, and during night flights, it would practically be possible to show movies on board, and all of this would be flying. And most importantly, we are still moving towards a transportation system. We want to create a drone based on this device that can carry approximately 500 kilograms over a distance of 500 kilometers. This is not quite commercial use yet, because the size is still somewhat small, but we will be able to work out all the technology for operating such devices at this scale. 
There is a purely commercial passenger version, a purely commercial advertising observational version, and let's say, a transport version. In other words, we hope to launch one device in these three forms in a piloted version in a year, and at the same time, we will start working on the unmanned version. How much more time will be needed to fine-tune the software? So that we could release it without any problems for a flight? So that it could take off by itself and land by itself? Yes, I am already aware. I will just ask questions that I feel you might have. So, is it easier to launch an airship with a pilot than without one? Yes, it's large. To be honest, we won't risk lifting such a large unmanned airship just yet. But we are... I will talk a bit about this now. We will be working on the control system for the dynamics of this device to reduce risks in several steps. Currently, the dynamics are already functioning, working on a dynamic model in Simulink, and we want to create a simulator for this airship and with real control systems which, let's say, will not be exactly the same as those that will be on board, but they will be similar in functionality movements and everything, and with real pilots so they can try flying this airship, express their comments on what they like and what they don't like. At the same time, we will work on the ergonomics of the cabin, develop the dynamic model, and refine the presentation. And this is a significant step towards creating a piloted version. Additionally, we want to take one more interesting step which we estimate will take us a few months, about three, four, maybe five. It's still hard to say, because the concept is not fully formed yet. We want to create a small, fully geometrically similar drone of about 100 cubic meters, purely electric, meaning without any gasoline engines. There will simply be advanced electric engines and a modern, state-of-the-art battery but it will be completely and precisely geometrically similar, meaning all proportions will be highly maintained in every aspect, and all control systems will be fully and exactly geometrically similar, just scaled down, and we want to launch it as purely unmanned in all respects. That is, immediately after the simulation phase, we will conduct a comprehensive test on the 2000 on the simulator, and then we will carefully scale it down and fly the small, 100 cubic meter one. Once we successfully create it and develop the control system, we will take off with the 100 cubic meter one in an unmanned mode right away. This will also be extremely useful for flying, for trying to dock with a low docking mast without people and to take off from it. And the most important thing is that by comparing the results of the simulation with the actual results we will record, its dynamic characteristics in flight, we will be able to validate our dynamic model. In other words, we can understand how well our dynamic model corresponds to reality with this small airship. That is, there will be accelerometers installed, we will program various maneuvers, deflect the rudders, change the thrust vector, apply thrust, and observe the dynamic reactions of the device, we will also calculate and record everything in the dynamic model in the simulator. It is very interesting to overlay the results of real flights onto the results of dynamic models in the simulator. To summarize, we have the external appearance of our 2000 model ready. We know what kind of tail it will have, where the engines will be located, and what type of propellers will be used. All correct. The engines have been selected, but the propellers, though their size is determined, haven't been chosen yet. That is, we already know, so to speak, the geometry. We have a fairly detailed understanding of everything. Right now we are selecting components, which means we are forming a team. People are joining us, we are forming a team, and we are creating, so to speak, a pool of co-executors who will help us with this work. And a very important decision was made. We decided to go with an electric remote control system, meaning we will have pilots who will control the devices using joysticks. 
That is, there will not be a control yoke or pedals like in old airplanes. We will control it with joysticks, and the actuators will be operated by electric drives. In other words, you have already, so to speak, reached a preliminary agreement with the group of developers. There is very close communication, and a technical specification is being written to formalize all the questions, so that later there are no questions about why this or that is done. In other words, as they say, if there is no proper technical specification, it ends up being a mess. Therefore, it is essential to write a correct technical assignment where the more detailed everything is laid out, all our wishes, the higher the likelihood that we will get exactly what we are thinking of. And most importantly, even the technical assignment is not just written casually. It requires careful consideration. It is written in close collaboration with the developers. When we write and discuss everything, the developers already suggest to us and at this stage, it is clear what is possible, what is not, what is better, and what is worse. I hope that soon the work on the development of the SDU will proceed in close connection with our dynamic model and our simulator. We are pushing this pool of questions forward because it takes a lot of time, and all questions must be resolved at the earliest stages of work. The second very important thing that we must focus on now is the power unit with vectoring, with thrust vector rotation. There is already an understanding of how we will implement this, and the first sketches have been made. The engine has been selected, but I cannot say that it is final, as negotiations with the engine supplier are not yet complete, and we do not know if they will be able to meet our deadlines. But I hope that in the next two to three weeks, we will fully finalize the engine. The development of the transmission is proceeding in parallel. The components have been selected. The designers are already working on it, sketching out the transmission. So we will have a proper airship with steering and thrust vectoring. For now, we are considering making it capable of about plus or minus 90 degrees. But if it works out, if our design of the turning node allows it, maybe we can even make a slight adjustment backward so that we could so to speak, use these engines to slow down a bit. There are many questions during the conversations. If we are following hot leads, then why even deviate from the screws? Most likely, a question arises there. Well, let's respond. After all, no one flies like they did in the 1930s using pure aerostatics, meaning constantly thinking about keeping our flying apparatus statically balanced. Airships, on the other hand, fly with a bit of extra weight. This greatly simplifies takeoff, landing, and operation. If it is overloaded, if we turn off everything in air, it will start to descend smoothly. It will descend smoothly. If taking off, it means... Lightweight, yes. If he doesn't go anywhere, then... This is neutral buoyancy. That is, our buoyant force will be slightly less than, let's say, the total mass of the device. It turns out that it is comfortable for the pilot to fly based on the experience of operating the airships U-12 and U-30, with comfortable flying for the pilot occurring when the overload is somewhere in the range of approximately 5-8% to 8 of the device's mass, or buoyant force, as it becomes heavy when it approaches 10. Typically, it is generally comfortable for the pilot. This is already closer to a hybrid aircraft and a hybrid aircraft should be made slightly differently. In essence, these ordinary cigar-shaped bodies can also be considered as wings, but their aerodynamic quality is not very good. Therefore, flying with large overloading consumes a lot of fuel and is not very efficient, which is why we fly close to neutral buoyancy, but with an overload of 5 to 8 percent in general. During landing, especially on a long flight, when we have consumed all the fuel, we might be landing close to neutral buoyancy, or perhaps even slightly underweight. This means that adjusting the electric thrust downwards allows us to land even when slightly underweight. When it is overloaded upwards, and when it is underloaded downwards. Usually it flies when it has already gained speed. The propellers are positioned horizontally, and we give the body of the airship a slight angle of attack, which allows for dynamic lift from the body. However, when we reduce speed, the aerodynamics no longer work, and the body does not carry us. 
so in order to avoid stalling and to land correctly in the right place, we need to manage our approach. We work with the thrust vector, turning it. So, for our Airship 2000, the power unit has already been selected. It is clear that it is not fully approved yet, but a steerable transmission is already being developed, and there is an understanding of what the propellers will be. Yes, regarding the size, but we haven't chosen it yet. We have selected the type because there are plenty of propellers produced worldwide. I don't think there will be any issues with the propellers. We have simply postponed this question as the most important one. The only thing we know for sure is that we will not use variable pitch blades on a small device. All of this involves hydraulic control. Firstly, our speeds are such, and secondly, the inversions are not significant enough to go for that. We will simply use fixed pitch propellers. The only thing is that it will be, let's say, adjustable by import, meaning that the necessary installation angle of the blades is optimally set on the ground, and then we fly with it. In flight, we cannot change the angle of the blades. Well, this is so far about this specific small device. Yes. Because for him, this is a normal solution. There is no need to complicate the design. It should be optimal in terms of, let's say, such functions. And since the device is small, its inertia is low, and we consider damping its inertia by engaging reverse thrust or changing the blade pitch unnecessary. And I hope we will verify all this on a dynamic model, and all our preliminary calculations will be demonstrated by the dynamic model and later real flights will show and prove all of this. And the dynamic model will be a small 100 cubic meter one, where the engines will be located, and everything will rotate there, with similar rudders. But this is not a dynamic model. This is, let's say, an unmanned geometric analog of transactions, while a dynamic model is what is inside, in the brains, in the computer, on the simulator. That is, there is a computer with a powerful processor, three or four monitors that show the situation completely to the pilot, as if the computer is simulating the entire terrestrial underlying surface, clouds, sky, all of it. And based on the dynamic model we developed, it simulates its movement. The pilot controls the instruments, and it feels as if he is sitting in the cockpit, meaning it is a regular simulator, as if he is in the cockpit of a real flying vehicle. He sees the earth, he sees how he is moving, and at the same time we are writing down his characteristics and transitional modes. Here he took the controls a bit. Well, we noted what the actual accelerations were and what speeds were recorded. And then, when we build the device and actually fly, we will install, let's say, a block of accelerometers that will record on board, and the pilot will do the same. We will actually record it and then compare. We want to compare this first on a flying model, on a small one. That will already be... Fix the large dynamic model. To look, yes. Then check it, and a second time. While we return to the simulator, it turns out that the person who is engaged, is he part of its building? Is he already on our team? Yes, someone is working in the team. When will the simulator be available? Very interesting. Let's think about it, but I believe that, so to speak, the problem now is not even in the dynamic model because, in my opinion, he has already so to speak, completed it, well, I can't even say to a large extent, approximately 60 to 70, 80 percent at this point in time. Indeed, the current problem is that we cannot yet fully determine how the control mechanisms of the airship will be arranged in the cabin. The model which is a crucial component of our project, will appear before we, so to speak, complete the detailed simulation of the pilot's workplace. Currently, we are making efforts to accelerate this stage of work significantly so that the simulator appears as quickly as possible, meeting our project deadlines. Month. It will be before the new year. It turns out that a person who creates a simulator also creates a dynamic model. Yes, course. Since he is creating a dynamic model to make everything clear, we have all the control mechanisms. We understand how many there are, what the thrusts are, and what the propellers are. This part of the work is done. Yes. And it is carried out, it turns out, by the company Nova, by the specialists of Nova. How many specialists are approximately currently working with you? We have...
It's just I specifically didn't prepare, and I can say indeed. We have a chat. Project management of approximately 15 people. And 15 people already. You see, it's already a team of 15 people. That's already a team. This is already a crowd. At the conference, we will discuss each person in detail and what they do, and we will even show some interesting things. The conference will be on the 16th of November, it seems. So, a large company has gathered. Work is underway, as it happens. It turns out, well, I want to talk a little about the fact that the entire work actually started in a chat. In Telegram, so to speak. Additionally, yes. Yes. Then gradually we started. There appeared corporate emails. There appeared local drives. Now there is an attempt, or rather the start of implementing a PLM system. And at the same time, what you did, what is it called? The breakdown. Detailing. This is called a division scheme. I still can't remember what it is called. Well, this is a division scheme. It is essentially a table that lists all the main components. First, at the top level, the main components are listed, and then further down, the smaller components that make up the main ones. It currently takes up about five pages, or rather four pages, which detail the components that include the airship. This is still not a very deep level of nesting, so it can still be worked with. As the design is being created, it will change the division scheme because it must correspond to the structure of the design documentation, that is, how the design documentation will be issued. Here is the upper assembly, what parts it consists of, and what parts this part consists of. This is the division scheme. This is an official design document. It even has its identifier E1, and it is not made in the form of a table, but rather in the form of squares like a tree made of squares, but this will emerge in the process of work. It exists in the form of a table, but it's already something. We can start assigning responsibilities for individual components. You are responsible for this, you are responsible for that, and we urgently need to find someone for this component, and so on. It turns out that Vadim said five pages, but there are still conditional headings. There are decimal numbers. Specifications are released. Decimals are available. I mean that we already have responsible people. Yes, those responsible people. The question is, how many more specialists do we need? Well, I wasn't prepared for them. I can't say who it will be. But it will be someone from our team. And someone will be outsourced. Is it 50% of specialists, or is it still 20%? The airship is small. Let's say it's 50%. It might turn out to be 55%, or it could be 49%, so it's hard to say right now. But let's assume it's not. 50% of the division scheme is closed? 50% of the division scheme is closed. It seemed to me as if almost everything was closed, if described in broad strokes. If we look at it broadly, yes. But if we go into details, if we look deeper, it turns out that there is one person here, and this work is overwhelming for him. He needs more people. Understood. So if you think about it, plus or minus 30 people, we are already... Yes, 30 people is actually a very good team, and for such a small airship with a volume of 2,000 cubic meters, I believe that more is not needed, more is not needed. Well, when there are other projects, we will certainly grow, because there will be a different level of responsibility and a different level of development will be required and everything that corresponds. Perhaps when we start certifying this device, we will also need more people because it will be necessary to produce what can currently be done, so to speak, based on the preliminary documentation. We will prepare full docs, otherwise the certification authorities simply won't understand us, when they will require the complete and detailed presentation of the design documentation for the entire device. Understood. What else to talk about? Well, from what has been done, it is better to talk about what has been accomplished. Let's think again about what we can boast about. You indeed brought a partial printing laboratory here today. Yes, yes, yes. We also have this feature that we are very eager to implement. We certainly already have extensive experience. We have indeed done this and experimented with it a lot. 
we ultimately want to make part of the components of this airship, let's say, using additive technologies, meaning we essentially wanted to print them. In particular, at this very moment, the designer is currently working on making sure that the safety valves are absolutely fully printed and the fans, because a calculation has been made, so to speak, we have precisely determined the maximum vertical speeds. It turns out that we have fixed them at a level of exactly 7 meters per second. That is, if we decided that our airship will fly at a maximum speed of approximately 30 meters per second, that is roughly 108, well, maybe a little more, give or take, it will reach 110, 112 kilometers per hour with a cruising speed at around 100 kilometers per hour, and we recorded a vertical ascent and descent speed of 7 meters per second. A calculation was made, so to speak, of the aerostatics regarding the air consumption we need, because I reiterate that this device is built using a soft scheme and the shape of the hull is maintained solely by internal pressure. Therefore, the internal pressure must be maintained very strictly within very rigid limits, meaning a table of all pressures has been formed. Each system responds accordingly, such as when the fans are turned on, when the valves should open, when the pilot's alarm for excessively high pressure should activate, or when the pilot's alarm for excessively low pressure should activate so that he can make decisions in case of any emergency situations. When we allow the gas valve to open and lose gas, this is only in emergency situations. The warning system should alert us that the pressure in the envelope is high. Only after that is the gas valve opened, because we really do not want to lose gas. All these values are already documented. We know them. And calculations for aerostatics have been made based on these values. We know what air consumption we need to stay within these limits. And so, for the 2000 airship, which is a significant advancement in aeronautical design and technology, it has been meticulously calculated and carefully reviewed by experts, although not yet officially approved, but it will be officially documented in comprehensive technical manuals and detailed reports. We need to ensure, with precision and accuracy, that the valves are engineered to release a precise volume of 500 liters of air per second at a critical excess pressure of approximately 500 pascals, which is essential for maintaining the airship's structural integrity and performance under various atmospheric conditions. The valves must be designed in such a way that there will be two of them. This is absolutely necessary for ensuring safety. In the event of a failure of one of the valves, we will need to descend very extremely carefully. However, in principle, no serious emergency situation arises. We need to significantly reduce speed. On the contrary, the valves open gradually when we ascend upwards, when the gas expands, and when we release air. So, we need to ensure that the two valves provide an airflow of 500 liters per second or half a cubic meter per second at a pressure drop of 500 pascals. In principle, the valves are not that large, with a plate diameter of about 220-225 millimeters. The designer has already started working on the design of these valves, and they will be manufactured using additive technologies. Accordingly, the fan turns out to be approximately the same. That is, when we descend at a speed of approximately 7 meters per second, two fans must indeed provide us with an air supply to the envelope of essentially half a cubic meter per second, also at a counter pressure of about 500 pascals. We are also getting fans with a blade diameter of about 200 millimeters, and the blades should rotate at around 8,000 revolutions per minute to achieve these characteristics. So far, everything seems to be going well. The electric motors will be around one kilowatt, according to our calculations. These are the fans and valves that will be located somewhere around here. They are right here, next to the gondola. To avoid running the lines too far, we will try, since we have a single balance scheme and a two balance scheme, meaning there is a ballon here and here, I'm drawing so that those watching can see. Therefore, we have to install valves here and fans here and run the lines and electrical wires along the shell from below so that the pilot can open it manually. If he doesn't like something, then in a single balance scheme, when we have a ballonet approximately, 
The gondola is under the ballonet. Everything can be placed right next to the gondola. It's even convenient for the pilot to see. Here is the valve. Here is the fan. There is a large amount of glazing. He will see everything. And the most important thing is that the route will be short. We won't take any extra oil. Friends, I hope you have already figured out what a ballonet is. A ballonet is a bag that is filled with air to push out helium and maintain pressure in the soft structure of an airship. It is not exactly a bag. That is, it is not made like a bag. It is made like a membrane, meaning there is a shell made from the main fabric, and inside there is a membrane that divides this volume into two cavities, an air cavity and a gas cavity. In its fully completed state, the air cavity occupies about a quarter of the volume of the body. This allows it to fly at altitudes of up to two kilometers above sea level, and in order to rise higher, this system needs to be different. To ascend higher, we need to create a larger air cavity. If we want the range of altitudes at which we fly to be greater, then we need to have more air on the ground. And when we ascend, the gas will expand, and almost all of this air will now be one quarter. To rise there, for example, to 10 kilometers, how much more than half will that take up? 10 kilometers, I can even say now, may occupy about two-thirds. This is not good for airships indeed, so to speak. Airships are still something that should not fly in the mountains. It is better to fly closer to the surface, to sea level. To sea level, yes, I really like it. I have already told everyone repeatedly that I really enjoy flights to the islands. However, it is impossible to create aviation routes between the islands. The distance is small, 100-150 kilometers. Is that distance even suitable for a normal airplane? It doesn't have time to take off. But for an airship, it's just perfect to fly 100-150 kilometers with people. If the airship is well designed, it will be safe. We firmly believe in this and we are doing everything to ensure that it is so, and it was sufficiently energy-equipped to withstand the wind, so that its own speeds were adequate. But when we start building real passenger airships, it will probably be at least 130-140 km per hour, preferably 150, so that it is, let's say, not a toy of the wind, but a real device. So, the 2,000 cubic meter airship is not a passenger airship. It is not designed to fly from point A to point B, although that is also possible. It is more of a sightseeing airship. It takes off from point A, flies over the beautiful Yagarski waterfall, over Lake Victoria, over the castles of the Loire, and over two monasteries, the New Jerusalem Monastery and the Sergiev Monastery. Feel free to suggest more. By the way, you can all make suggestions in any way where you see the use of such truly wonderful and exceptionally beautiful places in various locations in our vast and diverse country that people would want to see from a bird's eye view, so to speak, without vibrations, without jolting, without the noise of helicopter blades, just to enjoy and look at the beautiful sights in a serene manner and tranquility. They immediately ask the question, how much will it cost? How much will it cost? It will depend on the serial production. The question here is whether we need to mass produce these airships. We need to move on to something more powerful. Naturally, we need to go further. The question is, what to do with this? Will we produce it serially? It's hard to say right away. Let's make it, we'll fly on it, and we'll immediately see how in demand it is. In any case, six-seat helicopters and planes are quite in demand. They are not used on any regular airline routes, but these planes are sold, and people fly on them. Yes, it's not a cheap pleasure. Never, let's say, a six-seat plane, if we sell tickets for it. Will the tickets ever cost as much as those for a medium-haul airplane that carries 150 passengers? This is understandable. But first of all, you have to start somewhere. Secondly, there are people who are willing to pay such amounts. I think that for an hour-long flight in a very beautiful place, it doesn't matter whether the prices are in rubles, dollars, euros, or yuan. You are watching now, and you will name the questions later. Well, we won't mention the price. Let marketing be marketing. 
How much will everything cost? Well, I think we should start when there is cereal production. It will decrease, but we should begin with a price of around $200 for a one-hour flight at that price level. I think it's quite democratic, although in general it could be cheaper. It can be cheaper, but you must follow a certain path. Naturally. So this can't be done just like that. We just took it and said, here, we will do it for $3. Now we will try. That won't work. Yes, overall this is more of a question of the business model. It is absolutely not necessary to cut profits on these excursion airships. Well, everything you understand that we have great surfaces, meaning that part of the expenses could be for general advertising. Our financial and economic department calculated that if we tokenize the entire surface area of the airship into 10 by 10 centimeter cells, essentially creating cells and turning them into tokens, the cost of each token would be reasonable, allowing us to sell advertising on the airship using these tokens. Overall, our demonstrator will pay for itself twice. Let's definitely build it faster. No one is dragging their feet then. Everything works. Everyone is working. No, I'm joking. Everyone is working. So, let's see. They are sending me a few more questions. And I must say, but I'm not really keeping track at the moment, to be honest. A large, comprehensive, and detailed video is currently being created, by the way, part of which will most likely be shown during the upcoming and very important conference, if it can be completed in time. The second part will be released shortly after. It will be about large dimensions, about 300 tons, and about 200 kilometers per hour. It is a dream, but we will strive for this dream. This is not a dream. It undoubtedly turns out to be a good objective. Hey guys from Solar, if you are tuning in and watching, and you are watching right now, where are the questions? You promised to send them in private messages. I'll go check on vContact for now. And in general, our additive <coughs> workshop will be right here, in this location. I can't say whether it's the second or third door, most the third. A room has already been allocated there, and we have also brought in the printers, and we are starting to set them up in the process. Maybe next time it won't be feasible yet. It will be a trial, so to speak, a test. Well, when it happens in a week or two, or on November 16th, I hope we will show how this direction, this constructor, is progressing in the process. Also, there is someone who is working on the development of valves and the construction of valves and fans. This is Sergei Vereshchagin. He is currently sitting behind the wall and doing everything. It is working. Yes. I am exploring the new T-Flex program. I mentioned before that we decided to try T-Flex to see if our activities align with their software product. Primarily, we are interested in PLM. Secondly, in CAT, and it's unlikely that this is an engineering analysis system. They, let's say, will not close the questions, but let's say looking right away, the designer drew the details and immediately tested how well they correspond to what was intended, whether they can withstand the loads that will be imposed. This can be done directly in the T-Flex frame. Of course, the strength specialists do not work in their programs. They will read more detailed reports on strength later. Yes, this is what I was getting at, that Sergei Vereshchagin is already sitting down, mastering T-Flex. We were given these trial versions of T-Flex, installed them on local computers, and we are already trying it out. I think that by November 16th I have a dream that we will definitely already demonstrate something, some pieces of what we have achieved and how we are moving in this direction. Ideally, the simulator should be placed there on November 16th. The simulator is very fast. It won't be possible to do it too quickly. We won't even have time to get all the hardware for it. We will, of course, order it now, and what we have ordered will be supplemented. But I think, God willing, if it arrives in 2016 in boxes, 
That would be wonderful. Well, it's clear that we need to launch everything, set it up, and take a ride ourselves. So they say, and the all-metal ones, you are building airships, go. But why all-metal? Why did you decide that all-metal is the way to go, and what are the advantages? Nowadays, modern materials are rapidly emerging in the industry. People are gradually moving away from these traditional materials. As I have previously stated, I have already mentioned that modern fabric film materials like Vectron and SVMF are even superior to traditional metal materials in many aspects. In terms of specific strength, they have surpassed all metals and even carbon composites, but they are not used in such constructions because we are still working under tension. I can't even recall the figures right now. The modulus of elasticity is at the level of steel and they weigh more than twice as light as aluminum, while their strength is also comparable to that of steel. Just imagine. If we look at gas permeability, there are now plastics that provide, let's say, barrier properties that are not worse, although they are certainly worse than metals. It's difficult to compare with metals, but nevertheless they are quite suitable for us. The helium leaks they allow are, in general, quite acceptable to us. Again, as you know, I mentioned the fibers. I don't know if you looked at it or not, but I can tell you about it again. When the era of ballooning began, the strongest fiber available to engineers was cotton fiber. And let's delve a little into textile terms. The specific strength of fiber is measured by textile specialists in centinewtons per decitex. What is a centinewton? A centinewton is one hundredth of a newton. And what is a tex? A tex is a thread that weighs one gram but has such a thickness that at a weight of one gram, its length is one kilometer. Decitex is a thread that has such a thickness that at a weight of one gram, it has a length of ten kilometers. Threads of this kind and fabrics made from such threads are not actually produced. The real threads from which fabrics are made are 100, 200, or Decitex 50, 60, depending on the type of threads. However, textile manufacturers measure specific strength in centinewtons per Decitex. Here is the specific strength of cotton fiber. If it were cotton, it would be less than 3 centimeters per Decitex. The best long staple cotton varieties provide a specific strength of fiber somewhere around 3 to 3.5 centimeters per decitex. In the 1940s, chemists invented nylon. Nylon already has specific strength. This is about 7 to 8 centimeters on the decitex. That is, nylon is twice as strong as cotton, the best cotton. Somewhere in the 1950s, polyester fiber appeared. We more commonly refer to it as Lovtsan. This is a commercial name that was used in the Soviet Union. Abroad it had many different names, such as Dokron and some other commercial names, but this is polyester fiber. This is already about 10-12 centimeters. Then, in the late 1960s, Kever appeared. This is about 22-23 centimeters. Already 10 times. But Kevlar is not ideal for balloon applications, such as ropes, because when you pull it steadily, it has a very high strength, but when you pull it suddenly or abruptly, it can break under much lower loads. When Vectron appeared, which is also about 23 centimeters on DCTX, you can pull it however you want. And efficiently, the textile made from Vectron for melting fabric is just what is needed, and effectively, science is not standing still people are working on it. People think that fibers appeared that are approximately 29 centimeters long in length, but they are not very convenient because the fiber degrades quite rapidly and easily, especially affected by the combination of high temperatures and moisture conditions. An experimental batch of bulletproof vests was even made, and a number of these vests were purchased. However, when they were subsequently put to use, they were simply left exposed to the air, in heat and humidity. When they went on the mission, unfortunately there was a tragedy. They could not save them because over the years that the body armor had been lying around, but for some stratospheric applications, isoilon is exactly what is needed. It is cold there, and there is no moisture, 
It is also sensitive to light and degrades fairly quickly under ultraviolet light. However, if it is protected, meaning if it is somehow shielded from ultraviolet light, Isoilon can be quite suitable for stratospheric use. And even better, even better, is the ultra-high modulus polyethylene. And there is such a dependence that the thinner it is pulled, Reception, reception. Guys, write how you can hear. The sound is fixed. Yes, they say the sound was bad. The sound has been fixed, so we are back. I was talking UHMWPE ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Its specific strength very much depends on the thickness of the thread. The thinner the thread, the higher the specific strength, and there, in principle, you can already achieve 35 centimeters. The other thing is that technological problems with the use of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene have not yet been solved because it does not allow heating above 160 degrees Celsius and has very rigid welding modes. So you can't just weld it, you need to invent how to assemble these shells. Otherwise, this is a very promising direction. That is, UHMWPE is the future of underwater diving. In general, we remember. But if you go down to Vitran, it's ten times better than it was a hundred years ago when zeppelins were flying. So perhaps will it be just ten times stronger? Well, zeppelins didn't fly because they had a rigid airship. It was simply made of percal, this cotton, just a covering, while the frame was duralumin. On the other hand, what is duralumin? Its specific weight is about 2.8 grams per cubic centimeter. Let's say the allowable calculated loads are around 350 megapascals. Modern carbon fiber, on the other hand, weighs about 1.4, 1.7 grams per cubic centimeter, with a strength above 1,000 megapascals, definitely three times stronger. So if you make a zeppelin out of carbon fiber, which is a material known for its exceptional strength to weight ratio and durability, it will most likely be lighter compared to traditional materials like aluminum or steel. I can't say by exactly how much it will be lighter, because not everything is determined solely by strength. A lot is determined by stability, which is crucial for maintaining the structural integrity and balance of the zeppelin during flight. So possibly by two times, maybe by two times or maybe one and a half times. We need to calculate, observe, and see how it will be. Then there's how much technologically simpler it is. So, the technology of the Zeppelin involved rolls of duralumin. They were cut with band scissors, and then from these cut strips, special omega-shaped beams were bent. And then from these omega-shaped beams, their spatial structures were carefully assembled. All operations were very labor-intensive and complex, with a lot of manual labor involved. That's why not many zeppelins were built. Modern methods using round tubes for connections, like gluing them together securely in place, allow for many possibilities indeed. So therefore, as such, it follows logically enough. A modern frame made entirely out of carbon fiber tubes will be lighter overall, less labor intensive too, plus more reliable. Well, according to this scheme, Bryn is moving forward now. Yes, Bryn is moving forward as planned. Well. I don't know all the details of how he did it, why his airship turned out to be so heavy. Most likely, it's because he is building a purely electric version. He wants to fly only on batteries, so there are no internal combustion engines on board. This is the first experience. They have just flown for the first time, just ascended into the air. Let's see what happens next. I think that everything can be done more easily. They did not choose the most optimal path. Yes, I indeed think that the strategy we chose, to move from small to large, allows us to refine it in time. This is how they immediately took on something large, a project or task that was quite significant in scale and scope. This is generally risky. Yes, they built something like that, a structure or system that was quite complex and challenging. Oh, a little off, and the cost of error is very high, potentially leading to significant consequences or setbacks. And we would talk about strength, and the same with gas permeability, 
which are crucial factors in the performance and reliability of materials. The first fabric materials, these cotton percal that were rubberized, had helium leaks of about 6 to 7 to 8 liters per square meter per day, which was a significant issue. When modern plastics like polyurethanes or even PET were added, thin films were integrated, it all became less than a liter, showcasing a remarkable improvement in material technology. If the fabric is of high quality and well crafted, then the helium leakage is significantly less than a liter per square meter per day in most cases, without punctures, purely due to diffusion. And contemporary advanced materials have emerged with even better barrier properties. They are now used everywhere, in various industries and applications, and are cost-effective and affordable for consumers. That is, they are used in vacuum packaging to extend the shelf life of packaged meat products. This, if memory serves, is correctly called ethylene vinyl alcohol, which is a type of polymer. It is specifically known as a copolymer of ethylene and vinyl alcohol, two distinct chemical compounds. Polyethylene, on the other hand, is formed when a single ethylene molecule undergoes polymerization, resulting in a long chain composed solely of individual ethylene molecules linked together. And there are cases when two participate, that is, ethylene and vinyl alcohol, it results in a chain of ethylene vinyl alcohol ethylene. So this is EVOCH, which is denoted by the international designation E, written like our E, V-O-H. Well, the slang term EVOCH is what everyone calls it. And we seem to have bought up all the film that we currently had in Russia, in fact. Well, it's impossible to buy everything, they will make new ones. Everything that was in the warehouse... Yes, everything that was in the warehouse, friends, we have already bought up. It turned out to be about 16 square kilometers or so in total, which is... No. Or in length? No, this is definitely the length, but it... After all, what was bought is polyethylene evoke. The polyethylene was made as a batch for vacuum packaging. Well, now we will try to make stratospheric balloons. This is the very long drifting one that will fly. The first one will be made from this film. Yes, we bought the film, everything that was on the market. In order for it to be produced again in our country, a very large batch needs to be ordered. I don't remember exactly how much, but it's some kilometers. Look. And this EVOH already has a gas permeability of much less than 0.1 liters per square meter per day. Even the guys told me 0.02 liters per square meter. This is when there are no punctures, no damage. How many times better is this than rubberized fabrics? Already a thousand times better. This results in a thousand times fewer helium leaks. And all this is available in a material that crumples like this. It is very technological, and it's easy to produce shells from it. After all, only one all-metal airship was built. This is the American ZMC-2. It was made from aluminum. Imagine how much effort people put into it. They took and rolled out almost foil. Depending on where this sheet is, it ranges from 0.2 mm thick to 0.4 mm thick. From these sheets, they riveted the entire shell with rivets. With rivets. They installed several hundred thousand rivets. Moreover, all the rivets were airtight, riveted through a sealant. Such an airship really flew. Yes, it had, of course, excellent barrier properties, and there were very small helium leaks, but unfortunately, due to its labor intensity, this technology did not progress further. Well, yes, it's too complicated. I'm scared to take the film in my hands to see how to rivet it. But when you work with a normal material that bends easily like this, it's much more pleasant. This is a brief mention of the labor intensity of manufacturing a modern airship and what they used a hundred years ago, almost from bull intestines that were treated with gold. It's just terrible. But unfortunately at that time there were no suitable materials that hold well. And then indeed, for those who don't know, let's remind once again that to reduce the gas permeability of the hydrogen bags used in old Zeppelins, it was very complicated. These hydrogen bags were crucial for the Zeppelin's ability to stay afloat and navigate the skies. That is, the inner layer of the epithelium was taken from the intestines of young bulls. 
This layer was specifically chosen for its unique properties that helped in minimizing the escape of hydrogen gas, ensuring the zeppelins could maintain their buoyancy over long distances. It was somehow processed. I can't say about the technology, I haven't looked into that question. And it was also glued onto percal, achieving a gas permeability of these bags at the level of 1-2 liters per square meter per day. At that time, it seemed like a super achievement compared to rubberized fabrics. It was several times better. There was nothing else. I even saw in some film how it looked. A woman is sitting there, well, I don't know, approximately 100 or 200 in the hall. And all these intestines are being sorted, which were brought from the slaughterhouse to extract this valuable epithelium to make a gas holding bag for such a wonderful airship as a Zeppelin. What exactly are they just asking about? They are asking a lot of things. In fact, we have two minutes left and need to let Vadim Vasilyevich go. I heard about the romance of tourist trips. But where are the discussions about Zeppelin long haulers? For the North, Siberia, the Far East, Africa? It's all in the plans. We will tell everything. This will definitely happen. However, these must be airships of a different dimension. After all, 2,000 cubic meters is not suitable for such journeys. When we, so to speak, create a proper design bureau, go through some process and reach normal volumes, all of this will happen. Yes, what was said about tourism was about where this 2,000 model can be applied. I remind you, it can fly autonomously in unmanned mode. It can hover over objects and monitor them. The drone can transport some cargo. What is the lifting capacity of the airship? Have you already mentioned it? This is the maximum we will realistically fly less. What is the air gas system calculated for? 7 meters per second, yes. And realistically, how airships fly is 2 to 3 meters per second. Well, I just really imagined 7 meters per second. That's quite fast. It's just that everything is done with a margin. You see, no one does it exactly. You need to have some margin, so we decided on 7 meters per second. It's a good margin. The question is, do you plan to build an airship that uses natural gas methane as fuel? It is indeed possible, and one can certainly think about it in various ways. The crucial point to consider is that it can be stored safely in a gaseous state right within the envelope. Its calorific value is significantly higher than that of traditional liquid fuel, and because of this advantage, the most famous airship of the past, the Graf Zeppelin LZ-127, was able to achieve remarkable feats. To again understand two figures, we must delve deeper into the historical context and technological advancements of that era. When it took on board approximately 40 tons of fuel, it could fly, if I recall accurately, for about 80 hours at a consistent speed of approximately 100 kilometers per hour when it took roughly 30 tons of fuel. At the same time, it could take around 40,000 cubic meters of blue gas, and it could already fly, I think, for approximately 120 hours at a speed of 100 kilometers per hour. So with blue gas, it made a round-the-world trip. It took off, made two intermediate landings, and returned to the same point from which it took off. And what is blue gas? Well, it's essentially a combination of gaseous components. What was the point? ultimately to achieve the density of gaseous fuel equal to that of air, so that the aerostatic lift and buoyancy would not change during fuel production. In essence, a gas mixture was selected that had the same density as air. The Germans called it blue gas. What shape of airship is optimal for you? In my opinion, I am a strong proponent of the classic cigar shape, but in order to explore various exotic and unusual shapes, it must be done with some significant potential gain. By deforming the hull, we gain the ability to fly with heavily loaded devices, meaning the lifting properties of the hull will be higher. However, to pursue this, extensive and thorough research and development efforts must be undertaken to achieve this goal. That is, just to take it, an artist looked at it, drew some design so that the hull would cost this way. This is generally a path to getting negative publicity. Something will come up, some flaw, or from the perspective of aerodynamics, something will turn out poorly 
or there will be some stall modes or instability or the mass costs to deform the hull. This way will be such that you will lose all the gains from aerodynamics. You can engage in this, but it must be done very carefully. Yes, and that's why we chose this model of development. We are moving from small to large and will have time to experiment with all possible options, rather than how many currently claim to immediately build a 200-ton version of a certain type. And they build? And artists draw from a critical point of view, which looks unconventional? Well, yes, in some respects, unusual. But what pitfalls are on this path become clear during the work process. Yes, any shape of such volumes must still comply with natural laws. If we set the task for this airship to move at a certain height, where there is a certain pressure at a certain speed, it is precisely these two parameters that conditionally outline its external appearance. So whatever shape is preferred, this is briefly about the task at hand. If the task is a fast high altitude airship, that's one shape. A slow near ground one, naturally, is another. And all forms, yes, are dictated by these two laws, as well as by strength of materials. Let's say, still, both with strength of materials and with greater aerodynamics, one must strive for minimal aerodynamic resistance. That is, again, if we take certain figures, the same zeppelins, which practically had no protruding parts, had resistance relative to the characteristic area. And the characteristic area for an airship is the volume raised to the power of 2-3. That is, if for an airplane the characteristic area is taken as the wing area, for an airship it is customary to take the volume because the volume is important for an airship. And to obtain the area, we simply calculate the root of the volume raised to the power of 2-3 and get the area. So, less than 0.02 or around 0.02 for zeppelins. This is the minimum of protruding parts, optimal elongation, and large sizes. Airships, unfortunately, or perhaps quite fortunately, really favor large sizes. As a matter of fact, generally speaking, that is, the larger the airship, the less resistance there is, and the fewer of these issues. In most cases, the more we can take in relation to the total mass of the airship, the more useful load we can carry. I have roughly explained everything. So I can absolutely manage the other questions myself. To simply answer, you actually need to run. Yes, thank you very much for listening to me. I hope it was interesting. Ask questions, and I will also answer them. Yes, guys, create some activity in the chat. We have a bit of a chaotic mode. The overtime work is ending and we will gradually be able to answer such technical questions in the chat on Telegram, so... We have a chat on Telegram. If you are watching this broadcast for the first time, in general, look for the links, the speed is going through the broadcast, find it, join the chat, and add yourself. There is a section question there, so ask your question. So, Vadim Vasilyevich, thank you very much, it's time for you to run. Yes, goodbye. What other projects? There are questions here when... Regarding other projects. And when these other projects will be, we will be able to form a roadmap starting around the new year or from the new year. Broadly speaking, it's all clear. These will be machines with an increased load capacity of 10 tons, 50 tons, 100 tons, 200 tons, and so on. But we need specifics. What machines? They should have requirements. And all this can be said in words. In words we said 10, 20, 30, etc. What specifically needs to be done now to start work on this demonstrator? Then some resources, including intellectual ones, will be freed up and we will figure out what will happen next. If you have competitors, well, you might wonder if you just go outside, look up at the sky, and you will definitely see some floating airships in the sky. And those are indeed our competitors, without a doubt. What is the difference between a stratospheric airship and a regular one? Well, even by the name. A stratospheric airship moves in the stratosphere, and the stratosphere is from 12 kilometers and up to the borders of space. If you look soberly at what a stratospheric airship can be in terms of height, 
it's around 15 at most 20. 20 is already quite a lot. But somewhere between 15 and 20 kilometers, it is possible to design and produce a stratospheric airship. That is, it is intended for movement in the stratosphere. A regular airship will not rise to the stratosphere because it is not suited for these tasks. It is not designed for that. As you might already know, as Vadim mentioned earlier today, even the internal air gas system has a special volume occupied by air to regulate the pressure inside the airship near the ground, which makes up one-fourth of the total volume. For a stratospheric airship, it's about two-thirds. So in fact, it's a different design. And that's why it can rise so high and perform a completely different job. As a result, if an airship of this size can lift approximately about 40 tons near the ground, then the same size airship can only lift a couple of tons in the stratosphere, due to the fact that the atmosphere is significantly thinner there. Here, the atmosphere is dense, and it has much greater buoyancy, as a result of the much increased buoyancy provided by the denser air at this level of the atmosphere. In general, that is essentially the main point. What are the specific directions for use? Which areas do you consider the most promising for airships? We consider the most promising directions for airships to be those that address the accumulated challenges and difficulties of modern business. There are tasks that no one is currently dealing with. These include remote areas where logistics are poor and the same large dimension somewhere, ensuring communication, such as, that is, there are many problem areas that need to be addressed. It is not worth going into places where everything is already established. That creates competition, a struggle for super efficiency, and so on. That can be dealt with later. Right now, we need to fill those niches that are open, which simply require and shout saying, we really need airships here, and many are already. They are clear, well-defined and distinct, so these are remote areas, large dimensions, and cargo transportation in these regions. Tourism is also actually a highly sought-after and popular niche, and many strive for it. In fact, it can also be taken as a goal because it is a good goal, but it is actually a micro-goal in terms of their characteristics. Creating a transport system based on airships is something serious, and not many take on something serious. In fact, everyone tries to build one, two devices that can start to pay for themselves. And that's tourism. Because to create any logistics with airships, cargo transportation, transporting large dimensions, anything at all, even when we talk about remote areas, that is still some kind of transport system. Creating a transport system is a big task, but it also offers much greater profit. So the main promising objective is to create a transport system based on airships, where the airship is an element. But naturally, from this element, we need to start by building the airship in order to ensure a reliable and efficient system that is effective. Even the initial demonstrator, the many indeed say, we can certainly build airships, we will certainly build airships. Well, you should first build an airship. As for us, we will build a small airship first, then a larger one. And evolution is still better than revolution, and we will grow into transport systems. How do you plan to establish communication with the airship if the signals are jammed? But there is communication with airplanes now, there is communication with helicopters now and there will also be communication with airships. As for what we showed during the launch of the stratospheric device, in fact, only the GPS which we used to guide the ground signal reception station went silent. We will have two more additional scientific experiments and furthermore we will also show you that the radio signal will indeed be received. And this is a bit about something else. It's not about the communication system on the airship. It's about that hobby that can be done in parallel, creating a stratospheric radio communication system. It's about that. With airships, everything is a bit simpler. How much can be earned in the airship business?
It's a question of scale, actually. The Germans managed to operate two airships. Or operation, as it is correctly termed, for tourist purposes. Seasonally, they make about eight or ten flights a day. Or something like that. At a time, they seat about 15 passengers on one airship, managing to live comfortably and be a very profitable company. This is indeed the operation of two, which cannot be called contemporary in terms of technology, but they are modern because they exist in the same era as us. The devices pay for themselves, there is excellent infrastructure for this business, and this company has great profitability. And this is just two devices. And they sell one device and put it together. Well, they assembled it initially and then sold it. They have assembled one device over several years and sold it for several tens of millions of dollars in total value, recovering its assembly cost multiple times over through this process. And that is generally enough for them to be satisfied with their business model. But if we scale this model up significantly, for example, it becomes possible to earn substantial amounts such as tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars potentially if this turns into a serial sale involving devices from different product lines, that is already hundreds of millions of dollars, billions. If this is a transportation system, that is already a lot of money. There is a video by a famous American blogger where he analyzed and compared airships as a transportation element with airplanes that carry cargo, with ships and with trucks, the most common means of transport in logistics in America. The video is detailed and provides an in-depth analysis. The blogger is well known for his insightful content. He examined the advantages and disadvantages of each mode of transportation. He compared airships and, in his analysis, came to the conclusion that the company that builds an entire fleet of a certain number of airships with a very specific payload capacity will be able to effectively and efficiently solve such logistical tasks on the planet, transportation tasks, that it will become the most valuable company in the world. And that is true. In fact, this needs to be done because I have mentioned more than once that our economic growth rates do not keep up with population growth rates and we need some kind of boost, a catalyst for the economy. And any economy actually thrives on logistics and our informational logistics have jumped millions of times, meaning we have developed information technologies but freight logistics hasn't really jumped significantly and noticeably yet because trains have been running for many decades and continue to do so, airplanes have been flying for a long time and the economy needs to add a few more logistical tools or arteries, so to speak, in order to effectively and efficiently keep up with development as it evolves and progresses in the modern world and beyond and everyone thinks that these are airships. In this context, when I say everyone, by which I mean reputable and well-established analytical agencies from a multitude of different and diverse nations and regions. So, I don't see any more questions for now at this particular moment. I haven't heard anything about Aurus at all. Will you implement this project? If so, please tell me more. Is the Aurus team with us or not? If you are going to work on it, when do you plan to start issuing the technical specifications for development? To issue the technical development specs, the preliminary design needs to be completed. We have the preliminary design in the initial stage. As soon as the preliminary design is ready, it will be clear. It will be clearly clear where Aorus is located in this preliminary design. So, as soon as the preliminary design is completed, to avoid being unsubstantiated, we will announce everything, tell and show and more. So, there is a big question here that was forwarded to me, but it has a note that it is specifically intended for Pavel Filipov, who is known for his expertise in this area. Why did you forward it to me then? One moment. Let me think about this. How many shares will there be per stock if an IPO is planned? There are indeed plans for an IPO which stands for Initial Public Offering, a significant step for any company as it transitions from being privately held to publicly traded. Regarding the dividend yield of the shares, I think it's a bit early to discuss all of this in detail. The project is in its early stage, in fact at a zero stage which means we are still laying the foundational groundwork. We called it a pre-stage to emphasize that we are in the very initial phases of development. The transition to the first stage will likely happen at the conference in mid-November. 
where we will have the opportunity to present our progress and future plans to stakeholders and potential investors. This conference is a crucial event for us, as it will set the tone for the next steps in our project development. The IPO will not happen earlier than three years after the project starts, so we need at least another year to understand these arrangements in the foreseeable future. But I think everything will be fine with the arrangements at this point in time. As for how many shares there will be per stock when the shares become stocks, shares will become stocks when the company goes public, it is anticipated that in terms of understanding the current situation and circumstances in relation to the project and its progress, as well as the arrangements that are currently in place for the IPO process. This will not happen earlier than in three years. That's for sure. Although anything is possible, we might start earlier, but the actual exit takes a long time. And in order to take the company public, the capitalization should not rely solely on expectations, although a company that produces modern airships can afford to go public based on expectations. However, it is preferable that it is also supported by some material components. This is a hangar where airships are assembled, a flight test center, and some bases where various technological processes are undoubtedly carried out. So, this extensive and intricate material base and comprehensive infrastructure cannot be created at the snap of a finger. It all takes time and effort. I think that in about three years the project will grow with all this fat, and we can confidently jump into an IPO. There are already the first flying vehicles, the level of expectation is immense, and not much money has been spent on the project, so the stock growth, well, the stock value will be significant and substantial. What exactly it will be is currently impossible to calculate a bit later in the future. So friends, I don't see any more questions. I apologize for the sound that it was sometimes a bit raspy and occasionally a bit quiet, and we will improve it. Someday we will sort all this out. Yes, that's about it. In general, it seems we talked about the news. The plans are to build airships, eventually in due course. There will be a lot at the conference. In fact, we are currently in a big stage, preparing for the conference. A lot will be shown and discussed at the conference. The airship's layout has already been formed and we will be able to tell more specifically what kind of engine, what specific propellers and what specific materials it will be made of. We will even bring samples of materials so we are preparing all this information for the conference. We are even partially holding back and not saying it, but it's not particularly necessary. We will arrange everything in such a way that those who can come to the conference please do. It will take place in Moscow. Those who cannot will see it either live or later in a recording. We will also bring stratospheric vehicles there and show what we launched during these three launches. Well, one has been done and two more will follow. We will talk about what was tested there and what will go there next. We will bring those materials that Vadim talked about today, as you know. I mentioned that they were all already purchased. From them, a very substantial and impressive shell will be soldered for the long-drifting stratospheric aerial vehicle. And from this same film, bags can be soldered for the rigid frame airship for those that will come later in the future. The next big load-bearing ones. The welding technology for these materials is currently being mastered by specialists from Bauman University. This is all being done under a contract with our company. At the conference, we will bring not only samples of materials, but also samples of seams, most likely already welded, testing protocols, and we will explain why we did the welding anew instead of using some ready-made ones. Well, it's clear that there is a specificity to all of this. We will also showcase something secret and interesting that hasn't even been mentioned anywhere yet at the conference in the Expo Center, which is a place where many exciting and innovative things are expected to happen. So yes, we are entering an active phase of conference preparation, which involves a lot of planning, organizing and coordinating. 
plus active work is ongoing, so the news will keep increasing and evolving as we get closer to the event. Keep an eye on the project and definitely discuss in detail about its existence. I periodically check the registration statistics, and you can absolutely influence the registration. Please, share this video, share any fragment you liked. We have released some cool videos and more will be coming out. The project needs registrations. We would like to develop in a dynamic and efficient manner, because all these questions, whether to build an entirely metal constructed airship, how much time you need, or how much one share will cost, and other related inquiries, can only be answered if the new project is financed at a sufficient pace, and ensure the project is adequately funded. People are interested as long as the pace is maintained at an optimal level. We are at the initial stages of hiring employees, renting an office, purchasing computers, equipment, testing materials, and buying these shells enough to build a hangar, and other necessary resources and other essential office supplies. To achieve this, the project needs to pick up the pace, so likes, reposts, subscriptions, and an active social stance are important. In order to successfully reach our goals, it is crucial to engage with the community actively. This means that every like, every repost, and every subscription counts significantly towards our progress. So that's it, we're off to work, and you help the project too. That's it, thank you all very much. Goodbye everyone, and take care.